Hello, everyone, and we're here with Suzanne Tippelhoff, the founder of BitNation. And um, we're happy to have her with us today, the first day of 2015, and um, for this exclusive interview with, with Suzanne Tippelhoff. Uh, Suzanne, welcome to the new country Hi. interview. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, right. Um, can you tell us a bit about your stuff in terms of like your upbringing, your um, yeah, your grandparents and stuff? Um, so, I grew up in Sweden. Um, I'm a Swedish citizen. Um, my mother is French. Polish, a sort of Polish. Um, so basically, my father uh, had to flee from Poland in 1968 because there was a prosecution against Jews. And, and so he came to Sweden and he lived as a stateless person in Sweden for about a decade. So, and he met, he met my, he had a travel document. So he went to UK and met my mother there. He studied English. At the time. So, um, anyway, so they moved to Sweden together, and um, then my brother was born, and then me ten years later. Uh, so yeah, it's it's sort of strange because I was obviously born and I grew up in Sweden, but none of my parents were from Sweden; they were both from different countries, and none of them had citizenship. I was the only one in the my close family who had it actually. So. It was quite a weird situation. My brother still doesn't have it, although he's like 40 years old. So, when my mother just got it like five or ten years ago or something, though she lived in Sweden for like 30 years by now. Oh, no, more actually, I think. Um, I'm missing crack off the years. But yeah, so I mean, this thing of nationhood ne never came to me as a sort of natural thing, you know. Um, also, like growing up in Sweden as, as a second generation immigrant is like we grew up in a pretty like sort of nice well off neighborhood where like a very Swedish neighborhood we didn't grow up in the ghetto or anything and so everybody was like basically tall and blonde and called son something you know like Hanson Svensson Ericsson you know something like that <laughs> everybody was like, extraordinarily similar <laughs> apart from my family. So it wasn't like, you know, if you grew up sort of in a mixed neighborhood where everybody is different and it's normal that everybody had different cultures at home, you know, you sort of, you don't reflect over it. You're just like, oh, that's how wild it is, you know. But when you are like the only one, <laughs> it's not like everybody else. And it's like, huh. <laughs> so, yeah, so I thought a lot about this, you know. I tried to feel Swedish. I failed to feel Swedish, you know. I, I couldn't like. Oh, sorry. I I tried to feel Swedish and I failed, you know. And because I didn't have the same culture or the same whatever, like I didn't feel the same way. I didn't, whatever, you know. And then I went to France. I lived in France for about three years because you know my mother is French and I also have French citizenship. So and. You know, but I don't feel particularly French either. <laughs> so I don't know. So then finally I was like, what the fuck? And then I, when I was 22 years old, I moved to Afghanistan. And <clears throat> when I was in Afghanistan, I was in like an expatriate community where everybody were like foreigners. You know, and then I sort of started to feel at home because we're all like foreigners in a foreign place together, you know. <laughs> And then finally, I was like, wow, these are my people, foreigners, expats. Like, and since then, I've just been living in expats communities around the world, pretty much. I don't have any real wish to integrate locally anywhere. Wow, but you know, it's interesting that your brother is 40, 40 years old, and he's still figuring out his citizenship. I mean, it's kind of similar mm. to 35. Um, but yeah, I mean, can you like elaborate on how come something so important like you know being citizen is still not solved for people 
so for some people in the world today, which is like a basic human right, I guess. Yeah, I don't know if I would call it a human right. I mean, I would say rather it's a human crime that it's a necessity. <laughs> Why should it be a necessity? Why should we be defined by a piece of paper that, um, you know, because of where we were arbitrarily born by a bureaucratic entity we haven't chosen? So I would see passport more as a human crime than a human right. Hmm? It's so beautiful. You really put it in an amazing way. Um, and obviously, you know, I would ban passports in the world if I could. What sorry? I, if I could, I would put all the passports in the world on a big pile and ban them. You know. Good idea. Is this why you started BitNation? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been thinking about it for a decade. I started to put it into words like a decade ago um, when I was in my 20s. But I, you know, I was more thinking in the sense like, okay, so I'm born in Sweden. I don't know. Like, there is no competition for the government. Like, elections happen every four years. And even then, you don't have a lot of say. You can just put one vote here and, like, you know, what's the point really, like, I mean, if I want to choose, like, a new cell phone, you know, I just go to the store and I buy it, boom, it's in an afternoon, like, why should governance be any different, right? Like, I, I don't get it, like, why should, why, why do I have to consent to the majority to get the governance services I want or need or don't need? Why should I pay for governance services I don't need? So I just figured the health system like seemed illogical to me, and I was like, well, it'll just be privatized, you know, and globalized. Also, borders obviously fuck borders. So um, there's no reason I could only choose one provider just because where I was randomly born, right? So, so I sort of started to write about it then at a very sort of immature level, and then it just evolved over like a decade. I worked in a lot of different countries. I worked for governments for a long time in, in like the many different countries and particularly in war zones. And you know, I was witnessing very closely, you know, the how, how people built governments and overthrow governments and you know, sort of assisted in both and uh, I did a lot of social science research of what people expected out of governments and and, you know, they had their level of satisfaction with different services and why and, you know. And I was just like, you know, this whole thing is silly, you know. And then I was like thinking more and more seriously how to do it. And I was like, well, okay, if you just have like an independent like service provider that provides all of those services, which sort of came quite naturally to mind, you know, like a contracting business. And I mean, I was a contractor, so. Um, and so. And then I still didn't, like, I thought it would be, like, a really sort of big, difficult, ambitious project because I was thinking, like, oh, well, I will need, if I'm going to, it will be sort of like a global insurance company in a way, right? But, uh, you know, for healthcare, for, like, all other services, right? Education, security, whatnot. But, but then I was like, well, to do that, I will need the backing of, like, a bank or an insurance company, and it's going to be, like, hundreds of billions of dollars and God knows what. So it was sort of like I wasn't sh quite sure how to do it, you know. And then I started writing about it more intensively. I left the government. I became more libertarian and anarchist, you know. And then, um, and then Bitcoin came along. It was just such a simple, brilliant solution, you know. They just created something better, and you know, with that to replace fiat money, right? And then I started to dig into like the technology behind it, the blockchain technology, and I realized it was like a public ledger, you know, like a public distributed database, you know, where you can just store records. And that solves so many problems. It solves, you know, you can do so much with that technology, like dispute resolution, you know, land deeds, mergers, corporate incorporations, you know. Uh, you name it, really. I mean, everything you can think of. It's like a public notary, essentially. So, and the, you know, apps started coming out even for, to organize like neighborhood security and like everything. I was like, wow, the technology actually exists to do this like extraordinarily cheaply and 
quite easily, right? So I was like, okay, well, fuck it. I'll just do it. <laughs> so that's about it, yeah. Wow. So um, you mentioned murders. How can how can the blockchain technology solve murders? Did I say murders? I don't think it said murders. But I, ha I must I must have <laughs> misheard. Um, maybe marriages? Marriages, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Apologize. Uh, can you explain what blockchain is in for, in simple terms? Okay, so, well, essentially, so Bitcoin is a payment system, right? A payment network, yeah, which, and also with a currency built into it. Um, so essentially the way it's built, it's on a public ledger, uh, which, so basically what happens is, uh, like when you do a Bitcoin transaction, it gets recorded in something called the blockchain, right? And the blocks are basically miners who are digging out the blocks, like, like out of a gold mine, because there are only 21 million Bitcoins in the world that would have been mined, you know? So, it, and that's basically, computers solving complex algorithms and when they solve that algorithm they get rewarded by a block of I think now it's 25 bitcoins the, the amount changes and it's sort of what that does um, so the difficulty what that does so um, and and they get rewarded by that which motivates the miners to continue so every time so those becomes a block, yeah, and those blocks forms a chain, and that chain becomes like a public ledger. And basically, every time you do a Bitcoin transaction, uh, you basically get enter into that ledger, right? So uh, it's so it becomes like a distributed, completely public database, yeah. And so that you can do other transactions than just currency transactions. So you can say, okay, so. You know, I will send like a very small amount of Bitcoin and a couple of cents to communicate with the blockchain, and then I will register a message with that transaction, and so that that transaction can become a contract. And I think it one step further. What's in evolution right now is so-called smart contracts, right? Where you can say, okay, so not only I'm going to send a message to the blockchain and record that message forever in a blockchain, you know, like a public notary. I'm also going to make that message execute other actions. So the other actions can be, for instance, uh, it can be, it can refer to a wallet uh, that is, that is referred to a wall that's all the time stamped on the blockchain, that can refer to a shelter contract, or a land deed, or a corporate incorporation, or an ID, you know, with a reputation system built in, or basically anything on the blockchain, or an insurance policy if you want, or basically whatever it is. And then all those actions communicate with each other. So let's say I have written into my contract that I only want, you know, this funds from this place should only uh, be be released from this wallet if X and Y happens to this contract concerning this person, you know, and it have the multi-signature approvals of these parties. And boom, suddenly you have an entire government right there, right? <laughs> yeah. How can, how can an insurance policy be uh, achieved through a blockchain? The, like, for example, you know how Airbnb have uh, one of Airbnb. They give you an insurance in case something happened to your to your apartment. If someone is staying and maybe something happened, they have an insurance policy. How can we do the same thing on the in BitNation? Well, I mean, it would be much easier to do it on BitNation. Actually, we'll cut out like ninety percent of the costs, basically, because it's it's uh, not everything is automatized, but a lot of it is. So, I mean, that wouldn't really change that much, actually, if it was done through the blockchain. It will still be people paying a certain premium to receive certain benefits. You know, but it's administrated to blockchain. So it's more transparent, and everybody can see it. And and in the future, when the technology matures more, which we probably will do within the next six months, um, it will be tied to smart contracts. Um, so that will be automatically executed without third-party involvement. 
so it's more secure for people, more transparent and more secure, and it cuts out a lot of the overhead costs of, you know, lawyers and bureaucracy, administration, and so forth, right? Because you have all of that straight on the blockchain. Yeah, and how how is it going to be automatically executed? Like, let's say someone's house, um, God forbid, got burned, and so how is the uh, insurance going to be automatically prosecuted on the blockchain? Uh, sorry, can you request some, please? Oh, I'm saying like how how can uh, like let's say someone someone's house got like God forbid got burned, how can yeah. the insurance? Uh, automatically ex get ex gets executed on the blockchain. Uh, well, at this point, it can't hmm, because a house can't communicate with the blockchain. However, there is such a thing as smart property being in the working, so where the property actually communicates directly to the blockchain. But that is still rather futuristic, and yeah? that probably won't come into full effect for another year or two. Um, well, it's not as, as sci-fi as it sounds like, but um, so yeah, I mean, you would still need an arbitrator, you know, in those sort of cases. But also, arbitration can be done a lot more transparent on that nation, you know, because you go online, you choose your code of law of choice, you choose your arbitrator of choice, you know, there's a reputation ID system attached to it, sort of like. You know, like hotels.com, people give reviews, right, and, and set calls for different things and different, like, you know, like this guy is great and British common law applied to family issues, you know, so good and Sharia when it comes to corporate Sharia issues type of thing. So, you know, that's that's pretty solid. Services actually already exist if you look at, like, one website called Bitrated. Uh, dot com, for instance, you know. Right. Is this again? There is bitrate. dot com. It's there is the beginning of that uh, of online blockchain based dispute resolution system. Although it likes reputational identity system and the choice of code of law and smart contracts and so forth, which we will integrate. Um, so um, yeah, I mean, obviously, like all disputes can be solved by a computer. Some will have to be solved for arbitration. It won't entirely remove the need of our arbitration, but but it removes the need of uh, of the state as a final arbitrator. Okay. What inspired you to start BitNation? Mm. Well, I had thought about it for ten years. You know, um, so it was just a matter of time, really. I just needed to, like, I wanted to obviously have more experience in life before doing it, and I got that. Like, I spent five years in war zone, seven years working for various governments, and um, I, then I started writing about it. I got a book to write about it. My book, I'm, I'm so, I still should finish, by the way, called The Woman, How to Build Your Own Nation and Change the World. And, um, which I started writing about two years ago, and so yeah, actually, I, nation. Yeah, the Google meant how to build your own nation and change the world. Oh, the the DIY guide to build your own nation and change the world. Um, so actually, I did a lot of the same as you guys with this movie. Like I, you know, I've been talking with people at the Seasteading Institute, a free. Free zones, you know, like all different types of communities, like, um, and yeah, I travel around the world doing research on it, you know, and uh, and then when I sort of saw the blockchain technology coming through, I was like, well, actually, rather than writing about it, I should just do it, you know, <laughs> like why wait? It's better to write about it after the fact. Then <laughs> you know, prove the technology first, and then write about it. Kind of thing. So, yeah. Wow. Well, actually, I got this uh, feedback from a friend. He said, "If you, if your goal is to create a new country, then you just go and do it. Don't mo make a movie about it." Um, but I thought, like, um, maybe a movie would be a good research 
you know, it's an, a good opportunity to meet amazing people doing amazing things like yourself, the Seasteading Institute guys, um, Max Marty from Blue Sea, all of those people doing like great, great things. Also, um, the Kingdom of North Sudan, um, uh, Jeremiah, the 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 Prince of Kingdom of North Sudan. So all of these people. Um, so yeah, those are my thought process too, like get really familiar with the subject and then do it afterwards. But then I sort of changed in the middle of the process, and I was like, no, I just do it. <laughs> that's really that's really cool. Um, so can we have like um, our film screened in BitNation somehow? Like how, how can we have like a, a film festival in BitNation? Like. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's in the physical location, and you know, it's it's purely virtual, so I don't really know what shape that would take in. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I was at my first sort of virtual conf Bitcoin conference the other day. It's obviously possible to do in a sort of 3D virtual world, like Second Lifestyle. I'm not too fan of that, actually. I find it a little bit clumsy and weird, you know, but... Um, it's a little bit sort of too SimCity childish, but um, let me think about it. There must be a, oh, you know what would be really cool, like to use like Oculus Rift type thing, like the whole like VR layer to it, the virtual reality layer. Oh, oh, say this again, sorry, V, what? Like if we could do like a whole like, you know, Oculus Rift virtual reality layer to it. Oh, that's, that would be so awesome. That's that's actually actually interesting. Okay, I have an idea as well. How about if someone who has land or a seastead, uh, like maybe the the Kingdom of North Sudan, uh, they they have mm. the, or they claim to have the land. Can they? Can he, for example, find a way so that we can apply or or find the land for a country? A country without the land that is that is bit nation. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I I'm not sure uh, we would want that to start with because the the thing is I really don't believe in you know the way I try and make the difference between governance one o and governance two o is the governance one o is sort of tied to geography. Uh, you know, so where you're randomly born or happen to live for whatever reason, you know, where relationship, you know, passport, whatever, shouldn't be, you shouldn't have just choose one service provider just because you are in that geographical location for whatever reason. You know, that would be like saying like, oh, okay, so you're in California, well, you can only use like LinkedIn, but you can't use Facebook and you can't use Pinterest and you can't use Twitter either. I'm sweet, so I only have the use the right to use like Twitter. You know, no other platforms, none. Only Twitter. You know, or but if I was Russian, then I could only use you know, God forbid, Tumblr. You know, <laughs> yeah. So that's, you know, I see government as much like social networks, right? Like to just be something that people can easily opt in and opt out of on a you know non-geographical basis because geography really shouldn't matter. So, you know, from an ideological perspective, I'm not sure we would want to have a geographical location because that's sort of against the policy, you know, and uh, and I, I think as well that geography matters less and less because of globalization, global communication, cheap transportation, global trade, global everything, internet obviously, you know. Um, Bitcoin, <laughs> um, and so regardless what we do, the nation state will crumble and die. You know, it's just a matter of time, and it's a matter of how they do it. You know, and it's a matter of what what we come up with as a better alternative. So I prefer to not think too much about geography. You know. Yeah. Well. But. Yeah. It, but. I have researched though how to declare a country, you know. Actually, you can declare a country very easily. Like, for instance, if I say, so technically the only thing you need to do to be a country is to declare that you're a country. So 
so if I say this room is my country, you know, that's according to international law, which doesn't exist, but you know, the international understanding of it is, you know, that's that's what it takes. But then you don't get recognized by the nations, so you can have your own country. You know, yeah, yeah, you know, I can make this this desktop my own country, this I mean this table my own country, but but I won't be recognized by anyone, you know, especially not by the government of Ghana. You know, if they come like rushing in my door saying that oh, you're doing drugs and I'm like, No, 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 I declare this my own country, you know, it's perfectly legal, they will be like, Yeah, well, we don't we don't recognize your sovereignty, you know, and so that's nobody else. So, you know, screw you, right? So Actually, to carry it is not a problem. To maintain it is a problem. <laughs> so yeah. Oh yeah. Well, well, it's coming from uh, a Palestinian refugee, which is me. Um, I don't really. The question of having a, a permanent residency in a country is is always on my mind. It's been always on my my father's, my parents' minds as well. Is that we need a place where we can. You don't have to renew the residency every three years. So, and that's why I'm still thinking about, okay, but I still need a, a geographical location to live on. And as, you know, a place where I don't have a permit to, to, to stay and live. So, how do you think this could be solved for people like me? Mm. Well, yeah, I know, because some of my family background is very similar, so, um, I don't know, I mean, frankly, I hope that will be solved by others, like, I mean, I'm a big supporter of, like, the seasteading movement, you know, the startup cities in Honduras and so forth, um, a lot of the, like, city-states, type of thing where migration is a little bit different, like Singapore or Hong Kong or, you know, that type of site is Bell Island, if that ever comes true. Um, I mean, the problem with land is that it, it, it needs approval from other nations, and that's where the trouble starts, because then you need to start dealing with, uh, you know, you know, like for a better while, the monopoly on violence, you know the geographical monopoly on violence that the state represents. So, which is an issue because, you know, then suddenly you need uh, cash and diplomacy and weapons and armies and, you know, I, I think the guys um, behind of the CSA Institute, but that's pretty far away in the future, and the guys behind the startup cities, Initiatives or you know the leap zone, uh, free zones in Honduras are doing a pretty good job. Yeah, it's going to take a very long time. Huh? Yeah, but you said something beautiful, which is the, the, the cash and diplomacy, and I think um, cash is one of the motivations of uh, been always the motivation for countries. You know, like we have to uh, export, we have to make um, like. A good economy and stuff like that. So, so these. Right, things, it's always about resources, isn't it? It's also it was sorry. It's always about resources. So yeah. Like control, so if control I control if I became a, let's say if I became a billionaire in Bit Nation, then maybe I mm. can you know maybe I maybe I can go uh, to the one government of the world and say hey I'm gonna give you. A certain amount of of, uh, of XBNs or, or in some sort, uh, so that I can buy my citizenship, like geographically in your country. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you already can, you know, uh, like in many places you can buy citizenship so very easily. So, uh, sorry, I think I hit the. Uh, it's not it's not that difficult. Depends on if you want a reader or a fake passport too. But <laughs> um, I mean, buying passport is like even in UK. Like if you want a fake British passport, uh, from the latest thing I heard, I'm not sure of the accuracy of that, but it seems like it's like that cheap, like about two hundred pounds, which is ridiculous, really, when you think about it. <laughs> so buying citizenships actually like rather straightforward thing to do, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You don't even need to be that rich, really. Um, 
So uh, I have a question from Dixie. Uh, she was asking. Okay, let me bring the question up. Um, can can you extend the to the citizens of of a country protection for their human rights? Like, how can you provide citizens um, of other countries with protection um, if needed? For example, she gave an example saying that uh, I think in in um, you know in Afghanistan, a doctor from London uh, was able to hire some lawyers, and they went to to prosecute to like um, to represent some of the women that have suffered from. Uh, so from people throwing uh, acid on uh, on their faces, so and he was able to get uh, uh, he was able to get like like some uh, like ruling in their side. So this is a question: Do you think like can you uh, as Bit Nation offer protection for citizens in other countries of the world? Yeah, I think so. I think most countries, um, like naturally, subscribe to sort of polycentric laws. Like if we take Afghanistan as an example, um, like in one village, you know, like any village, basically, you know, there will be people who Pashtuns who subscribe to Pashti Wali, or you know, maybe Tajiks who, who subscribes more to, you know, Sunni, you know. Sunni Sharia, or or there will be uh, Hazaras that are uh, Shia Muslims, etc. They all subscribe to different legal codes, right? And and you know, even if you have like a common centralized uh, code of law, they will still go to the village elder. They just don't give a fuck, right? And because that's how tradition would be done, and that's how it's still done. And one central governments try to implement a power on people, then that's that's when the war starts, right? Because people don't want to be under centralized governance. They want to follow their own personal laws. Or if you look at New York City, you, know, you will have a Jew and a Muslim living, you know, next doors. And religious laws will, in many cases, uh, overall, overall the national laws in whatever nation they are in, right? So, so I think offering a polycentric dispute resolution alternative where people can choose their own code of law um, and their own arbitrators will go a really long way to solve a lot of conflicts that are just, you know, in essence, cultural, really, because people are forced to live under the same legal system. Just because they are, they happen to be in the same geographical uh, territory, physical territory, right? You know uh, how you will tackle human rights in that situation. Uh, you know, I, I guess sort of the blanket answer is you don't, <laughs> because because uh, human rights is a centralized definition. Let's say you know. UN have their definition of human rights, um, you know, uh, Muslim cleric or a Jewish rabbi have their definition of human rights, and there wouldn't really be any space for that sort of centralization of lifestyle. And But I think that's a good thing, you know. Uh, I also have a question from a friend. He meant, you, you mentioned on the website, there is a service which is the security. So peer-to-peer -peer protection, individual security, contract enforcement. How are you going to do that? <laughs> okay, so peer-to-peer -secu -peer security is the easiest one. That's where we're going to start. Huh? So essentially, it can be easily done through uh, an application. You know, which people can download it and have on their cell phones or their laptops, or whatever. So basically. Um, it's based on the whole backbone of it is uh, the ID system with with the built-in reputation system. So essentially, if you fuck up your reputation system, uh, you can you know it will it will make problems for you when you want to do stuff like getting married or start a company or take a loan or whatever other transaction you want to do in life. Right, everything will be traceable. So 
you will be held accountable through your reputation that will be, you know, in the blockchain. And uh, in a blockchain, not necessarily the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, but anyway, so, so, you know, like in a lot of neighborhoods, there will be local thugs who go around doing stuff. And because they're incentivized to do so, because maybe they will earn something here or there, you know, make a little bit of money through stealing some old woman's purse or what, right? But if there is another incentivization system saying, like, okay, well, if you help this old woman to get her cat down from a tree or, you know, when, when fire starts in the neighbor house, you know, you, then people can tip you with, with Bitcoin, you know, through this app, you know, whoever helped you, and obviously will add to your reputation system, so everybody will, everything will be much easier in life, and it will follow you throughout life. You can't just move from one country to another, or from one neighborhood to another, right? The whole, your whole history will follow you and build up to who you are, right? So then people will have, like, a much greater incentive you know, first a, a long-term reputation system incentive and a short-term financial incentive of direct financial rewards to do it. So, so that's here to here neighborhood security. Because like a, when a friend of mine read this, he said, "Oh my God, this is like a, you're gonna hire a bodyguard or some or something to go and you know and do something." Uh, <laughs> well. I mean, yeah. No, I mean that's that's not the peer-to-peer -peer security, right? That's it, that could be like a layer, of, you know. Uh, later on, that's the sort of private security part. Yeah, I mean, if some people need private security, why shouldn't we be able to provide it, right? Like, but that's not directly blockchain technology related. Let's say someone is working in, uh, you know, in your liberalized area in, in North Sudan that is afraid of the local chief or whatever and they want a personal security guard with them, why not? Like I don't see any it sounds very sort of dark and sinister, but I, I don't I don't really see a problem with it, frankly. You know, if if people feel the need for it and they're ready to pay for it and there are people providing it, yeah. That's cool. Right. So you're seven, almost seven days from the launch of BitNation? Um, no, so that's just like the end of the crowd sale. But actually, we have postponed end of the crowd sale. Uh, the, cr the crowd sale is essentially just um, the, um, the seed funding round. Hmm. But we have postponed it until January 31st, but that has nothing to do with the timeline for the platform. That's, that, that's um, just related to, to the seed fund round. Um, but, uh, I mean, we're releasing, like, apps as we go. Uh, I don't really have, I can't really tell you a date set in stone right now for the release of the platform itself, because <laughs> yeah, you know how it is with devs, you know, you, it's always like something is going to take two days and then it turns into two months instead because there was a bug and like something. So, I mean, I, I'm afraid to just set dates at this point. Huh? But we are releasing like pieces of technology here and there that sort of builds up to it. Huh? And it's all public and it's all open source code, so anyone can fork it and create their own bit nation, you know. And that's what we want. Like, I, I want to see, like, millions of big nations in the world that competes against each other on just through providing the best customer experience, not because they have a monopoly on violence, right? I love that so much, really. And, uh, and I used to be obsessed by saying, okay, we should unite, like, you know, all of those small initiatives, like the Institute and the big nations and... Uh, and maybe the, you know the new country project should try to find a way to unite, and then we become powerful. Uh, but now I see like the beauty of competition. That if we have one big entity, then um, then we're just repeating the same uh, the same mistakes of the past. No. Exactly. It should be like you know, we're seven billion people on Earth. Like, imagine if seven billion people on Earth just had one brand of car to choose, you know, one dish everybody had to eat every single day, or 
like one 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 type of clothes that everybody could wear. That's ridiculous. Okay. It was somebody well, now we have like how many countries? It changes every year. I can never quite Let's recall it. Just over two hundred. Yeah, it's it's about two hundred eighty, right? But um well, I'm there are a few new countries. Like, nations, uh, sorry, micronations. We have like a I think we have like a, at least 20 micronations. <laughs> uh, yeah, but micronations doesn't have any functions. I mean, they're just sort of pet projects. Like, oh, here's a passport, you know. Oh, here's a flag. Oh, I also have a coin. It's like, dude, <laughs> I'm trying to do like the, you know, actual nation with real services that people need, regardless if they subscribe to the idea of a nation or not, right? Like, right. I don't care if they do. Our customers aren't people who are particularly libertarian or anarchist or whichever. They ideology has nothing to do with the end client, really. Yeah, it's not an attempt to be cute. Like, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, there are like 208 or something nations in the world right now. 250, 280. I can't really recall. It was too long since I looked at the numbers, but. And I have a bad memory, but um, but I mean, we are seven billion people on Earth. Like, so we should. So how, how many? You know, if you divide seven billion per two hundred and something, like, how much is that? Like, how many people should agree to each option? That's that's ridiculous as a whole, right? It is. It is indeed. Um, so what's wrong with humanity? This is a question from your TED talk. Yeah. What is wrong? Yeah. Why do we expect people to be the same? Why do we expect people to be to agree with each other? You know, we don't need to. Yeah. So how we can just have not to. So how can people? How can we have people become better human beings? Um, I just think of like. Letting go of trying to tell other people how to live their lives, you know, whether on a sort of governmental level through democracy, saying like, ah, oh, well, we should pass a law for X, Y, and Z because I think so, you know, or that makes sense to me in my life, or just on a social, like human level, stop like projecting ourselves onto others, like stop saying like, oh, well, I really think, you know. I, I really think um, Google Hangouts are terrible, therefore you should not use them. Why? You know? <laughs> or, you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 really, I really hate coffee, therefore you should not drink it. I just think people should let go of that sort of things, right? Like just say, well, I like what I like and I dislike what I dislike, but that is my own personal taste and preference and yeah. you know, each to your own. I think the problem with people is uh, well, there's different problems, but one is to people think that um, this is going to be better for everyone else, and especially people who think that they speak on behalf of God and saying this is what God wants, so this is what God wants for everyone. Uh, so I think this is kind of a, a problem when people start thinking they are God or they are kind of they are they are entitled to deliver God's message on earth. Um, I think this might be <laughs> like a thing whereby we, if we have the freedom to express our views and express and have the freedom to, um, you know, to just um, do the things that we want and you know talk and communicate and I deliver my message to you, I deliver my message to me, and then it's up to us to decide whether to, you know whether to what to believe in. I think it. You might be in a better uh, situation, but <laughs> there's something on my mind. Yeah. Even if they want to communicate God's message, like, go ahead, but do it for a volunteer audience. Or or even if they did communicate God's message, the correct message of God, pretty much regardless of which religion of the world you look at, is, is a message of peace and understanding and forgiveness and inclusion, you know? It's yeah. not a message of judgment or... Or war, or like anything horrible, you know, that that people some sometimes try to turn it into. So, 
I, I like to think that I communicate the message of God, you know, which is that of just being open spirited and think that we're all a unity and it doesn't matter who does that or who is who, you know, everybody have a place and a role to play and that's a great thing, right? You're absolutely tremendously right and I I feel the same thing, I feel the message of God is as well as is about the physical needs for humans, you know, like offering food, shelter, um, security for, for for one another, regardless of what yeah. you believe in. And it's uh, and it's ridiculous how it's the core the core of those messages. Messages religions are the same. People, um, unfortunately, they have so much separation uh, under the name of religion. I know, right? I mean, that's actually one of the things I really love. I, I assume you're a Muslim, right? Yes, I am. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing I, I think I love the most about Islam, actually. It's the social-centric aspect of it. Like, Islam, to a higher degree than, than most other religions, have, you know, the, I can't recall the word anymore, but, you know, this sort of the redistribution system that is like basically a duty in Islam and to redistribute to the poor on a regular basis, etc. You know, and the whole like it's a extraordinarily yes. strong family focus. Um, it is a strong family focus to Judaism too, but I think even more so in Islam. You know, that's that's what I found the most beautiful about Islam actually. I lived I lived in the Muslim world for a long time, you know, I really, really liked liked it. Wow, it's uh, it's so amazing. Like hearing you uh, saying this uh, from someone who's half Jew, we can say, or regardless of whatever. But but like, oh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a complicated family story. Jewish Catholic, yeah. Jewish more Catholic. Jewish than Catholic. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. So we have uh, almost uh, um, like a, a big chunk of human religion in this uh, conversation, that's good. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, but again, I, I guess at the end of the day, even though you actually made me feel good about, your words made me feel good, but at the end of the day, it's not about um, feeling good and, and like feeling good, oh yeah, my religion is good and, and I'm happy that, you know, Suzanne saying good things. I think it's about how can we really deliver the true messages of, of our religions and how can we unite um, in, in terms of, okay, you know, you believe in the same thing, you believe in food and shelter, uh, is it right for everyone, then uh, I believe in the same thing, then let's cooperate and let's see how can we offer humans, uh, humanity with, with food and shelter. And that's kind of what but I think. That's, but, but that's the thing, you know, I, I sort of, what made me change my mind, you know, whether I should write a book or actually create Bit Nation, like, I thought, like, spreading the message and creating a movement around it was the most important thing to do, and, and then things would follow from there on. Then when I saw, like, Bitcoin coming along, I realized that the opposite approach was right. So, you know, this sort of crypto anarchist currency was created, which was, you know, clearly... Uh, threat to fiat, you know, government printed money, right, to the monopoly, or well, semi-monopoly on currency, right, it's not a perfect yeah. monopoly, of course, but um, it's an attempted one, right, and, you know, Bitcoin didn't go out and say, oh, let's destroy, like, fiat currencies, they just said, like, hey, you know what, uh, you don't need to have an address to get a bank account, you know, you can just register a wallet online in, like, one second, Regardless how much money you transfer, you will have to pay a minimal fee, and you can transfer it instantly all across the world. And guess what? Like you can never print more money; it's a definite amount, so you can't inflate the money supply arbitrarily, like governments do. So, so people adapted it not because of any ideological reason, but just because it was better and cheaper and smarter, right? So that's what I was thinking when I started Bit Nation too. You know, I'm not going to go out being an ideologist about it, although I am, of course, naturally, but, but you know, my, my basic premises was just, like, I'm going to prove people through the utility that all the services they receive from the nation state government, they can receive through BitNation, but much faster and cheaper and more efficient and more transparent 
So, you know, if they can't do all of that, why would they use the nation state government? Like, let's say in Cambodia, if you want to rock on May, it will take you 104 days approximately, and it will cost you, like, you know, what is what represents many months of salary for a local person. If you can do the same through the BitNation platform and it takes you, you know, a total of an afternoon to do, you know, and you get tokens that represent shares that you can pay different values like dividend, um, you, you get, you can file a legal contract, a smart contract uh, on the blockchain that's timestamped forever. Uh, you can do, you know, you can do all those things that the government offer, but it will take you about one afternoon and cost you like let's say one dollar instead of instead of you know 104 days and costing you you know half a year, right? So I just thought it would be a better strategy to, rather than trying to spread a message, just trying to outcompete it by utility. Yeah, uh, a question about um, you guys don't have a in Bitnation. You don't have a, a currency, right? No, we don't have a currency. No, we we use Bitcoin as currency. I mean, as the default currency. Although, I mean, I would like to at some point be more open to like Dogecoin and Litecoin and you know next and other currencies as well. And I mean, if people want really want to pay in fiat currencies. We generally find a way around it, so people can do it. You know, we'll help them through the process and stuff. So, but yeah, no, I mean, it's it's pointless. You know, if if you look at what a nation is supposed to provide, right? So, at its very basic, it should be, uh, let's say, security. You know, security as in um, as in protection of private property. If we, I mean, if we strip the state down to its very minimum, right, like a night watch or state type concept, and dispute resolution, let's say, and, um, and you know, that's pretty much it, right? And then if we extend the concept a little bit further, then we have, like, you know, insurance. You know, when I say insurance, I don't mean private insurance. I mean, like, some sort of social, you know, education, healthcare system, whatever. That is crowd financed in some way or another, um, you know. Um, and then, and then maybe you know some people can extend it all the way. To think, oh, well, maybe it should also provide some sort of culture or religion or something, which is obviously optional, you know. I'm sure in a very short time there will be like a Bit Nation Sharia, you know, version or Bit Nation <laughs> whatever edition. Which is fine too, you know, if you want to gather around those ideas, right? There's nothing wrong with that. So, um, but yeah, so, so I think if, if uh, we look at just the basic functions of the state, that's basically it. So, I sort of lost myself. I, I'm not sure why I started, where I, what, <laughs> why I started talking about it. But, but I was asking about the currency. So, how can, if someone made money on. Yeah. An XBN. How can they spend this money? Let's say, let's say someone made some money on, like, he got some shares in Bitnation, and then he made some profits on those shares. Like, the shares went up. I mean, how can someone uh, benefit from those or trans transform those into? In well, it's just, yeah. it's just like if you have shares in Apple or Microsoft or IBM or something, you know. It's, it works just like any other, so we have like dividend paid to it, so basically on the profit we're making and what we have calculated as an estimation, which you know may or may not come true, we don't know, it's, it's like all estimations are obviously estimations, is that after, you know, two years we'll start to pay out dividend, we, you know, in two years we hope to turn a profit and then after that we'll start to pay a dividend, which will be about 10% of the total profit a year. Um, the rest we will keep on future developments and stuff, and that's a pretty standard stock market approach. Um, that's, I mean, 10% is pretty good, you know, from a stock market perspective. So that, that dividend gets paid in, in Bitcoin, honestly. Um, 
And so people receive money when they keep it because of the dividend payments, if it turns a profit, obviously. And if there is enough profit to pay a dividend. And, um, you know, if it doesn't, it's uh, like any other stock, it's speculations. You know, if you think the company is going to be successful in five years, if you think the company is going to fail in five years. And there are many, like, crypto exchanges where you can sell it. Like, we haven't put ourselves up on, a, on any exchanges right now because, because um, we want to keep the price stable while we do the seed, seed funding. So, but, um, yeah. Uh, I read that you're not really a company, that you're not incorporated, right? Well, are you not really a person because you're a citizen? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Whoa. <laughs> That's an amazing question. Point. How, how, how would you survive and, I mean, how would you survive until you're platform becomes big and uh, your your nation your nation becomes big and profitable well where is Bitcoin incorporated uh, that's the difference between Bitcoin and PayPal right right it's like the difference between BitNation and Yen okay one is a centralized centralized fag backed Platform, you know, the other one is a decentralized peer to peer networking. So even if, let's say, I go to jail, you know, and I, you know, I hope not, right? There will be thousands of other big nations. The concept will already be out there. It's forkable. The code is open source. Anyone can do it. It's it's an unstoppable movement. It already is. You know, we have ambassadors all over the place. People are starting to organize their own meetups, their own, you know, their own, their own activities, their own BitNation platforms. It's like the pirate day, you can't have it done once it's created. How can we make sure that BitNation doesn't go wrong, like doesn't become a big uh, kind of evil entity somehow because it's becoming like big and powerful? Um, how can we make sure that you know, good initiatives doesn't go wrong. You can even make sure that it doesn't go wrong, but if it does, it's all open source. You can fork it and create a new one. I love that. Whereas in in existing um, countries, yeah. companies usually, it, I mean, some companies put their code up up on GitHub so people can fork the code. We go like a step further than that. We put our business plans, our financials, everything up, and people can't can't only fork, fork the code; they can fork the very concept itself. That's so, if you don't like it, we're on, and we have all the material out there for you to do that. There is no secrets. No secrets. That's beautiful. Um, is there anything else you would like to add <laughs> to this conversation? Um, you seem like a cool person. You should join me in this. <gasps> My goodness, this is an amazing thing. How can I join you? How could you not? Okay, <laughs> I guess we have to talk more. <laughs> <laughs> so you're you're in Ghana, and then you're going back to Brazil. I'd love to have coffee and interview with a really good professional camera, like one day. Yeah, I'm going to try to make my way uh, from Mexico first uh, because there's a, a conference in Mexico called an Acapulco in Acapulco <laughs> um, uh, hosted by uh, Jeff Berwick from Dollar Vigilante. Um, so, uh, you know, it's going to be sort of lots of honor kids debating different monetary solutions and everything, which is cool. So I'm going to try to make it there and then after that go home for some time because yeah, I haven't been home for, for many months so it would be nice to see my home and my dog for a bit. So, um, uh, 
But I won't say very long because then my brother is having a baby in Sweden actually, so I need to head back to Europe and your brother uh, is expecting a baby? Yeah. God bless. Congrats in advance. Guess what he is calling it? Cyan, believe it or not. That's a pretty fucking loaded name. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> so. Yeah, I have to. Yeah. Yes, I. I. <laughs> um. That's that's really that's really amazing. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, but uh, come to Mexico. That would be easier actually. If you're in California, Mexico would be closer, cheaper. I think it should. When is it? Acapulco. No, no. When? When? Don't what? ask. What sorry? I don't. I don't know. I have to look it up. I'll I'll send you the link in to the conference. Uh, and I have to look that up. Hmm. Please do, and and I really, um, I just have to say that I'm really fascinated by what you do and and you as a person because once people see something as solid, it just uh, it takes people a different dimension. I mean, I'm quoting someone said, the human mind once stretched with a new idea, it will never go back to its original form. So, meaning when you know that Bitcoin. Kind of like the black swan thing when you know that the bit nation exists, and and uh, then the, so much possibilities could develop based on this. Even though you might, you know, you could be su amazing, successful, or moderately successful, or not successful, but you still you created something amazing. You took the human mind into a new direction that haven't been there before, and I really applaud you for that, and I uh, and I appreciate what you do. Well, thank you. That is so sweet. That is like the kindest thing I've had all year for like all year of. Um, so for it the no, that is. I was just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that is the sweetest thing I've had for like <laughs> ever. I think. <laughs> wow, uh, you definitely made my year, Suzanne. <laughs> and. Um, and yeah, we'll be in touch. Hopefully, next time I'll see you. I will be with a, a good camera, and um, and I wish you all the best of success with with Bit Nation. Really, uh, I hope to see you as well on uh, um, maybe I don't know Al Jazeera or CNN or something. Um, see more of I've it. been on RT. You did what? I've been on RT, Russian television. Yeah, yeah, I saw. I, I, that's why I didn't mention. It, actually, <laughs> yeah, that was a that was <laughs> a cool. Um, and uh, I think Kaiser Report is doing amazing stuff. Oh, anything that you would like to send to Russell Brand? Like, do you, is there anything that Russell Brand would fit into what you do? I I found Russell Brand incredibly annoying. You know, <laughs> I found him like, mentally confused and disturbed. <laughs> He says so much rubbish. What? You know, I, he says so much rubbish. Like he contradicts himself all the time. Okay, so it's nice that he's trying to make a debate, you know, which is not irrelevant. But the way he does it is like, you know, it's like walking up to a Wall Street bank shouting outside of it. It's like if we actually would have asked for an interview with a Wall Street bank, they would probably have accepted it. And sat down with him and answered his questions, you know. I mean, I'm sure a lot of them would have, right? But no, he goes up and then he tries to break his way in, and then he does like a big thing because they don't let him in. And he's like, oh, "That's how the establishment works." And <laughs> it's complete rubbish. Like, like anyone who like tried to do that would be thrown out because they don't have a pass. Like, if you don't have like a meeting appointment, you know, you don't get in. Pray. Which is the same in many companies, you know. If you go to Whole Foods, it's the same thing, right? So, like the Whole Foods headquarters, or whatever, right? Like it's it's just attention-seeking rubbish. Seriously, <laughs> I don't know. I have I, I do not have high force of the Russell Brand. Okay. Seriously, he, not. Well, he confessed about uh, being a bit uh, egoistic, but like in terms of you know seeking attention a little bit or like uh, being a, egoistic, but he. I really find his show, The Truth, really interesting in terms of 
you know, reading the newspapers from a different point of view. I I, I respect that, and uh, and I respect. But he doesn't have disciplined thinking. He's like redistribution, redistribution, blah blah blah. Russell Brown is a multi 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 millionaire. Like he is one of the richest person, <laughs> you know. And then he's going shouting like, oh, bankers and the government. It's like, don't redistribute enough. Okay, so why is he sitting on all his bazillions of dollars, you know, and not giving them to whatever starving children in Africa? Like, I mean, I just find his whole line of argumentation and thinking so extraordinarily confused. Mm. Um, that's a good so point. If someone has money, why wouldn't they give the money? Uh, I think it's just because there's... Well, I'm not saying if people have money, they have to give the money. I'm just saying if they're advocating for others to give money and they have money. They should right? be given some of it. Yeah, they should lead by example, right? Yeah. Well, we have, well, I will take that and I hope I'll get to ask him that question if I got a chance to interview him. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I would love to have a date with Russell. If you ever get a chance to interview him, like, please put men on it. I will like destroy him like that. <laughs> My goodness. Well, that is not a good intention for a, a debate, isn't it? <laughs> uh, okay. I will exchange ideas with him. <laughs> See yeah. for the <laughs> <laughs> um, That's cool. Well, uh, I was just want to check if there's we have any questions from anyone. Um, but I don't think we do have any questions. Um, but yeah. Uh, so one last question would be: This docu. I asked this question in the documentary. What would people, if we, if humanity were to create a new country, what would you like to see in it? Freedom. If if anyone creates a new geographical country, I would. Wanted to be a non country, so I had to live however I wanted. If I wanted to live with 3D printed guns and, um, you know, rebel anarchist friends and trading my bitcoins, I should be in peace and be able to do just that, right? So I would want a government who do not interfere with my lifestyle. His services, I can just pick and choose how I want them, when I want them. It doesn't dictate my lifestyle, my finances, my my ownership rights, or if I choose to not abandon those rights, you know. I think this is a good closing for this awesome interview with Suzanne Tempelhoff. Um, thank you so much for, for this and look forward to um, contacting you, communicating with you and hopefully interviewing you with um, a good camera maybe in Mexico. Um, thank you so much for what you do. I wish you all the best and uh, yeah, let's be in touch. Thank you so much for having me and let's do this. Let's create a better voluntary future together. Awesome stuff. Virtual high five. Psh. Psh. <laughs> but you didn't do that. You know, the Fresh Prince in Bel-Air type of, like, you know, the, oh. you know, the child of the 90s. Like, <laughs> you know. <the> <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, my God, you broke my heart in the new year. A little bit. <laughs> I'm joking. Well, uh, Awesome stuff. Good, um, good luck and amazing stuff to come to both of us and the world. Indeed. <laughs> Bye. Ciao. 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 Bye.